Good afternoon and welcome to another virtual program from Turnstile Tours. My name is Stephen DW and I focus mostly on the waterfront. Uh, Turnstile Tours uh, brings the whole city of New York and beyond a bit to, uh, to life and, uh, to, and connects it to people in our community. Uh, normally we do this through in-person walking tours uh, with uh, nonprofit partners such as the uh, Prospect Park Alliance and the Brooklyn Navy Yard uh, Development Corporation. Uh, but uh, during the pandemic, we've uh, developed this program of virtual tours, which has really given us a chance to expand our horizons a bit and go to places that are a little more out of the way, like the Robins Reef Lighthouse. And today we're uh, going to Staten Island and we're gonna take a trip back in time to uh, visit uh, one of my favorite places in Staten Island, uh, Sailor's Snug Harbor, and uh, to meet the, uh, the a gentleman who ran Sailor Snug Harbor by the name of Thomas Melville. Not no relation to Herman at all. In fact, he was Herman Melville's brother. And John Rocco, professor at uh, SUNY Maritime, will be with us to introduce us to these brothers and how their relationship uh, impacted uh, Herman Melville's writing and us today. So very excited about uh, getting into all that before. We get into that, however, uh, for those of you who are new to our program, I'd like to tell you about how we operate here. Uh, the, uh, uh, if you've not been on Zoom before, you'll see that at the bottom of uh, the, uh, the window, you've got some options. And one of them says closed captioning. So for those of you who prefer to uh, read what is being said rather than just listen to it, you can hit the closed captioning. And uh, my colleague, Andrew Gustafson, is back there typing away fiercely. We'll try to remember to speak slowly so he can keep up. And uh, so you can see uh, an approximation of what we're saying by using the closed captioning there. Uh, a, a big goal for Turnstile Tours is to connect people. And that's easy to do when we're in an in-person tour. We like to have everybody introduce themselves to one another and, and know why we're here uh, together on this tour. Uh, in the virtual world, we use the chat function. So uh, down there at the bottom, you can open up the chat box and, and uh, you'll see that uh, my colleague and our, our company founder, Cindy, is on there saying hello. And uh, uh, you can let us know where you're from and what your connection is with Herman Melville or Thomas Melville or Snug Harbor or Turnstile Tours. What brought you here today? So uh, we're looking forward to meeting all of you there. And you can put your questions for John Rocco into the chat and I'll keep an eye out there and, and pass them on to him. And uh, we'll, we'll make sure everyone's connected that way as well. Uh, I think that covers all the business we have to handle. I do want to uh, uh, make sure we, uh, uh, we're gonna talk about this a few times, but uh, Snug Harbor, Sailor Snug Harbor is a place you can visit today, uh, this very day. Uh, it is, uh, the grounds are expansive, they're open to the public and uh, we're, we're all big fans here of uh, Sailor Snug Harbor. And uh, within Sailor Snug Harbor, uh, one of my favorite museums in New York City is the Noble Maritime Collection. We've had them on the program before, talking about the Robins Reef Lighthouse. Uh, uh, last I knew, they were not yet open to visitors, but we're looking forward to their reopening soon at uh, Sailor Snug Harbor. Uh, so without further ado, I'll bring in John Rocco and we'll talk more about this place and these brothers. So welcome, John, if you'll uh, unmute and uh, turn your camera on. Actually, while John's getting his camera on, uh, Cindy, if you've got a moment, to, you can share your screen. Thank you. There we go. Let's look at some upcoming programs. So uh, we have the, the Maritime Story Continues. Uh, Tuesday, we've got U-Boats, Bootleggers, and Buoys, a history of the Coast Guard in New York Harbor. Uh, and uh, we're going to... Uh, uh, seaside to Coney Island on Friday uh, with Rev Jen Miller, who you may have seen our program early in the pandemic with her Troll Museum. You might have glimpsed in the back in the Troll Museum some of her paintings of Coney Island's cats. Uh, maybe you've met the Coney Island cats. They're all over and they're wonderful and she honors them in paintings. And we'll stay on the waterfront on Saturday with the Race to Hunts Point, which is a game about New York City's food system. Uh, and then uh, we have boat building history on Monday. I'll be back talking with Barbara Delensic from another one of 
my favorite museums here in New York City uh, and not visited nearly enough. It's way out in the edge of the city, up on City Island, the City Island Nautical Museum, which tells the story of the, the great industries that took uh, were on City Island and still are today, the oystering industry, which gave way to uh, yacht building and sail making. And sail making is still something to do on City Island today. Uh, one more slide. Uh, we'll come back to this at the end as well, but I do want to uh, make note that we're only able to do these programs with your support. And we appreciate your joining us today uh, at whatever membership level you are, whether an apprentice or a quartermaster, uh, you're uh, becoming a member and, and encouraging your friends to join us keeps these shows going. John, welcome. Great to have you here. Good to see you. you. Welcome. And, to Thank you. And where are you joining us from today? I'm joining you from the North Shore of Long Island. Excellent. I am also on the North Shore of Long Island, but within the uh, limits of New York City in Flushing. So uh, uh, good to have you on the same coast. Uh, I'm really excited about this topic, and, uh, and I, I saw a version of this presentation a couple years ago at the Waterfront Museum in Red Hook on the Barge. Uh, I, I can't wait to see uh, what you've learned since then and uh, uh, let's just get into it. And, and uh, uh, be, before we bring up the slides, however, how did you get interested? Can you tell us something about how you got interested in Herman Melville and Tom Melville in this topic? Uh, I got interested in Moby Dick as most people do because it's everywhere in our culture. Uh, I guess I tried to read Moby Dick for the first time um, the year before I went to college. And like most people, I could not make it through. It's one of those books that you, get into 820 chapters and then there's the wailing, then there's the blubber. Um, more importantly for me, the, the connection between Tom, the young, Melville's youngest brother and Herman became um, important for me when I got my job at SUNY Maritime College. I heard there was an archive there of Sailor Snug Harbor and for the next 15 years, I never went near, near it. Um, I knew it was directly connected to Herman Melville. I'm a Melville scholar. I knew uh, Tom Melville had uh, ran the place for 19 years, but it didn't, didn't just dawn on me to actually look at the archives. The archives themselves, though, at Stephen B. Luce Library at Maritime, is an extensive collection of the will, from the beginning will, that established this incredibly um, intricately uh, maritime institution connected directly to, the, to New York City. At the same time, the archive at, at the library is extensive. It runs through everything from, very, from the very opening of the place to its modernization. And more importantly too, I discovered through the, just the archive itself, how Tom Melville was instrumental in modernizing the entire place. He actually um, put a Melville stamp on the place in terms of discipline, something I'll come back to later when he started to use the word taboo to punish residents or inmates of Sailor Snug Harbor for various infractions, usually for drinking, for intoxication during the daytime, sometimes for not going to church. So there are these elaborate tab taboo books, which basically list indiscretions by inmates and their punishments. What's fascinating about the word taboo and its uh, sibling word tattoo, they come from the Polynesian islands in the early part of the century, particularly from Cook's voyages. He brought the word tattoo back. The word taboo became a part of just popular American parlance with the publication of Melville's first novel, Typee, in 46. So as we're gonna talk about it today a little bit, the uh, incredible institution that was Sailor Snug Harbor was directly connected to the Melville family, literally connected, we'll talk about why. And more importantly, it really, in many respects, casts a uh, revealing light on Melville's lost 30 years when he gave up writing and became a customs inspector on the New York dock for 19 years. Well, this, is, this sounds linguistically uh, dynamic and complicated. And of course, Sailor Snug Harbor itself is, is a huge subject. So uh, uh, we'll, we'll touch on what we can in the time we have. Uh, let's uh, get on into it. I'll, I'll uh, bring up your slides and we'll uh, uh, take a look at uh, what we have here. Uh, here's a 
kind of a collision of slides, right? Of course, on the, on the left is a connection between famous graphics for the novel Jaws by Peter Benchley and of course the great film by Speed, Steven Spielberg. Um, if you know the book, but the Benchley book, Benchley novel, it is chock full of uh, Moby Dick references. And of course, Quint, the obsessed captain of both film and novel version, is in many ways an Ahab descendant. And more importantly, of course, the big fish story is just that, the big fish story. On the right is a piece of Melville happenstance, circumstance that's, that seems to have followed him throughout his life. Strange things happen to Herman Melville. Uh, often they were pretty much a part of good luck early in his life. Late in his life, bad luck seemed to be the only luck he could um, get. Um, what's on the right side of the screen is the dedication, and Melville's dedication is always very important to his novels, but this is a dedication to his novel Redburn, his fourth novel. Uh, it was a book that Melville himself didn't like. He said he wrote it for tobacco money. And he wrote that and White Jacket, uh, in a kind of white heat um, writing binge to make money. Uh, Redburn is about his first voyage at sea uh, on the a packet ship between New York and Liverpool. And it's a, it's a wonderful- first ships that traveled on a regular schedule and- uh, Exactly. Epitomized by the Black Ball line, of course. Right, right, which really made New York's economy. And we've talked about that in other programs. And if you haven't seen those, uh, definitely check those out. Yeah, I would highly recommend Redburn uh, for, for that take too, Stefan, because it, it gives you the whole hour voyage and then the return voyage with Irish immigrants that has to be read to be believed. It's really kind of fascinating testament to a couple of things, right? To Melville's own experience at sea, but to, as you mentioned, that incredible connection between um, shipping out goods and bringing back people. It's, it's an amazing book for a lot of reasons. Melville hated it. But he did um, dedicate it to his youngest brother, Thomas Melville, now uh, a sailor on a voyage to China, right? Now, this book comes out in 49. Um, uh, Tom Melville at this point is at the beginning of his sea career. Tom Melville goes to sea at 16 in uh, 1846, and he follows directly in his brother's footsteps. In fact, his brother actually takes him to the, his first whaler in New England. Uh, reminiscent of Melville's own uh, first uh, shipping out on a whaler, the Akushnet, in, in much earlier. More importantly though, uh, Tom Melville will spend 20 years at sea, uh, as Melville's biographer Herschel Parker has called it, looking at Thomas Melville from Melville's perspective, must have been like looking at a mirror, but a mirror of a mariner who took that as a calling for his professional life. Melville sails for a very important four years, which radically alters his life and gives him the fodder for his novels. But uh, Tom Melville goes to sea for, for 20 years. He begins as a boy, a boy, a green hand aboard a whaler at 16, ends up the captain, of the master of speed record holding clipper ships, running from uh, New York and Boston to China and India. So he, he, beco he becomes quite a mariner in both um, experience and in um, outlook in many respects. And it's perfect fodder for his job later as um, governor of Snug Harbor. But we'll talk a lot more about that. If, if I was going to say, let's take a look at the uh, yeah. Snow Garber. And incidentally, uh, uh, John Bryant, a, a Melville critic whose name may be familiar to you, he uh, uh, seconds your opinion. He says, Redburn is the best Melville novel that nobody reads. Well, John Bryant is um, the greatest treasure for Melville scholars ever for a lot of reasons. And, and John's working on um, a real comprehensive biography of Herman Melville, and it should be out in September. And whatever John Bryant says about Melville is what you should do, because he knows more about Melville than Herman Melville does. More importantly, yeah. here's that famous picture we think is Melville at Snug Harbor, uh, probably in the, in the 1870s. This guy over here, right? That guy over there. Uh, again, we believe it's Melville for a couple of reasons. One, the other figures in the in the picture are dressed as Snuggies. They're wearing the Brooks Brothers suits and hats we associate with inmates of Snug Harbor. 
Um, there's been, you know, a calculus done on this figure. Is it Melville's beard, his stature? It's about his height. Uh, we do know this, though, and there are very few pictures of Herman Melville, particularly in New York. Um, we do know this, that the Melville family was consistently at New Brighton, at the grounds of Snug Harbor for every major holiday, for the 4th of July, for obviously um, Christmas, New Year's. There was a famous Christmas dinner in the early 70s, which Tom Melville got into some trouble with, with the trustees because of overabundance of feeding his family. But we'll, we can talk a little more about that too. Uh, most Melvillians, Melville people believe this is Herman Melville. Uh, people who know Staten Island and Snug Harbor uh, say it's Herman Melville without a doubt for a lot of reasons. But. And I'd like to point out, you can stand where he's standing in this photo today. This place yep. still exists. Uh, and a question from Ronan, uh, why is it called Snug Harbor? Is it named after a person? Um, very interesting question, and we can go into the history of Sailor Snug Harbor, and it's a fascinating one, but uh, we have to remember that Sailor Snug Harbor was the first major philanthropic institution, uh, secular, for working sailors. Not for the Navy, not for the U.S. Navy, but for merchant mariners. The money for this, of course, came from a uh, legendary uh, pre-revolutionary uh, figure named Thomas Melville, who was a privateer during the French and Indian War, who became a captain uh, of industry and of early New York, and who owned most of lower Manhattan. I'm sorry, what was the privateer's name? Thomas Randall. Got it. Did I say Melville? I think so, or maybe <laughs> yeah, I just- I probably did, right? There's Thomas Randall, and of course his son was Robert Randall, whose will endowed the institution. But it was Thomas Randall who greeted George Washington into New York after the Revolution in 83. It was Thomas Randall who owned most of Lower Man, what, what, what we would call New York University today. That was all the Randall farm. And basically what the will did was to take that enormous amount of money that was got from, gotten from prizes from the ocean, right? From French ships, particularly. And to really funnel it directly into New York City through this institution. And of course, the thing about the, the will itself, we believe Alexander Hamilton wrote it. I once, at a lecture at Snug Harbor, raised the doubts that maybe Hamilton just put notes into the thing. And Aaron Urban corrected me, because it is. It has to be that Oz and Hamlet had his hand in that will because of its incredible creative nature of connecting it directly into uh, New York City. The original trustees of Snug Harbor were the rector of Trinity Church, the mayor of the city, et cetera. It was directly connected. And of course, this is important to note too, that the Sailor Snug Harbor Trust still funds mariners to this day. There's over 300 of them that they still help out with. They were on site until what the 60s or uh, when did so the uh, 70s when it moves to a uh, sea level Carolina um, and that 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 facility is closed to it was really the first world war that emptied the place Stephen, and it got in trouble with tax reasons and I think we mentioned earlier too Jackie O had a hand in saving some of the architectural marvels in the place yeah, I don't know. If it's here. Yeah, so this is sort of the the bird's eye view perspective on the place. Uh, you can see the place we were just looking at is right here. The water we're looking at is the Kilban Cull. So the harbor is that way, and New Jersey is uh, both uh, Bayonne to the bottom and uh, Elizabeth to the right. And uh, Jackie O came in and saved the place, and, and just like uh, she did with the Grand Central Terminal, but. Uh, not before we lost a lot of these buildings. I do want to point out, uh, uh, you mentioned Aaron Urban. I can't uh, remember if you mentioned uh, that Aaron Urban founded an organization currently housed in this building, which is the Noble Maritime Collection. Incredible collection by incredible people. Yeah. So, so this is what the place looked like. Uh, I'm not sure, this looks like probably early 19th century. I'm not quite sure what date we're looking at here. Probably, probably the Melville years uh, at, at its height. Uh, Tom Melville, again, expanded uh, the residence, expanded the, the, the infrastructure, the fence, put up the Robert, the Robert Randall statue that had been ordered before his administration, but put it up. Um, 
and, and we'll talk a little bit about it too, he modernized the record keeping in, in, in a way that we could really see when you actually go through the archives themselves. Let's keep looking at this then, yeah. Here's my school, and, and notice that it was established in 1874 with the oldest uh, maritime college in the nation. In 1874, uh, Tom Melville was running Sailor Snug Harbor. So that's kind of interesting connection at the same time. At the same time, too, if you, if you look at maritime culture, New York maritime culture, it's very much connected, right? There's the Sailor Snug Harbor trustees. Then there is the... Um, other connections between merchant mariners of the period, they're all connected to, I'm thinking of the Siemens Church that you were talking about. Yeah, yeah. Siemens Church Institute, yeah. Yeah, and in, in many respects, they were all connected directly to the early American economy before the revolution, and then after the revolution, the Port of New York just takes off on this. Uh, uh, that, that website is our collection of archives. Excellent. Ronan asks if you need to reserve tickets to enter uh, for Snug Harbor, you can walk into the campus and check it out at your leisure. Uh, as long as the gates are open, the uh, interior of the buildings and the Chinese Scholars Garden, those are places that are uh, exactly. by admission. And uh, yeah, so, so not quite open yet. Ha ha, here's a, a bit of our archive. Now, this is from a book. Um, uh, it, it's a book by a, an English mariner. It's a voyage narrative. Of course, sailors love reading about a couple of things, right? Voyage narratives and voyage narratives, two things. Um, this was a part of the Sailor Snug Harbor Library. You could see the ink mark there, right? The library was an extensive library. The, the Snuggies had uh, many things to, uh, to, to occupy their time, right? They had a working farm. They had model buildings. They had an extensive library and theater. The theater had state-of-the-art, um, state-of-the-art sound, sound system for anyone did too. Early Snuggies were all um, photographed and early uh, photographs too. The record keeping was extensive. More importantly though, this is a book that survives the library and it, we believe it was donated by Herman Melville to the library. It was a book uh, we believe he used for his third novel, Marty. More importantly, he signed it. Uh, famously, Melville had bad handwriting. His H's look like M's. So Merman Melville, April 10th, 1847. Uh, as John Bryan knows, and I'm glad he's listening to this. This is, this is uh, months before, several months before Melville marries his, his wife, Elizabeth Shaw. It's uh, time, a time in Melville's life when he was happy. He was a working writer making money in demand for, for his writing, uh, a part of the press. Um, August, he marries Elizabeth Shaw. Now, he married well. Early Melville's life was a fascinating one of, of luck and of, of prospering. His novels, his first novel, particularly Taipei, is a bestseller, making him rather famous. He marries well. He marries Elizabeth Shaw. Her father is Lemuel Shaw, Chief Justice of the Mahas Massachusetts Supreme Court. Now, this figure is a major figure in Melville's life throughout his life. Uh, he actually dedicates his first novel, Taipei, to him. Uh, Shaw, Lemuel Shaw, was a major figure in American jurisprudence for a lot of reasons, not the least of which was, of course, the Fugitive Slave Act. And he had many famous decisions for good ones or bad ones. He was involved really in the cutting edge legal problem of that famous law. And of course, the beginning of what would turn into be the Civil War. Uh, Melville had a great friend in Richard Henry Dana Jr., his hero sailor, and of course a, sailor, a hero to many sailors, who was an abolitionist, of course, and in many respects fought legally against some of Shaw's decisions, particularly the Anthony Burns decision of 1845-54. Melville uh, himself was anti-slavery, but not an abolitionist. Uh, That's an important distinction to me. Uh, we uh, uh, have a question, uh, speaking of other connections, uh, is uh, there a connection between the Melville family and Melville, Long Island? No, 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 no. Yeah, uh, the name Melville is an old English name. There's actually an island in Antarctica named Melville Island for an English explorer, right? Long, Melville, Long Island, no. No. And uh, we're, we're going to move ahead a little uh, with some alacrity here as we're uh, uh, not, uh, we're about a quarter of the way in. And go after. for it, Seven, go. Yeah. 
Again, yeah, this is an early portrait of Melville, happy Herman Melville, when he was on his early lecture tour for Taipei. Uh, he was a romantic figure of that time. Um, in a famous review of his early speeches, he was seen with the, a cigar and his Spanish eyes. I don't know what that means. He had dark eyes. This is pre-mustache, just obviously. Uh, yeah, I, I gave a talk last year about the 200 years of Herman Melville, because it, again, it's kind of fascinating in the sense that he dies in 91, really unknown to Americans in, in a great way, right? Today, uh, Melville, and just a novel, Homie Dick, is everywhere in our popular culture, cartoons, comic books, science fiction culture, has its own niche in, in, in Moby Dick reference, particularly Star Trek, particularly the early series and you know, the Wrath of Khan show. But it's everywhere a part of our culture, which is fascinating because Melville, of course, was um, a great artist who was delving into great ideas and great conflicts. But he was also a consumer of pop culture, and particularly in terms of sailor lore, sailor stories. And of course, one of the most famous of them all was was uh, the legend of Mocha Dick and of the sperm whale you could not catch. And, and Moby Dick, of course, is an amalgamation of many of them. Melville on a stamp, he would be shocked. He would have been, he would have been shocked by all of this, I believe, right? Uh, he goes to his grave right there in 91, un, unread. Uh, Again, this is a famous stone in Woodlawn Cemetery. Hart Crane wrote a great poem about it, if, if you know that too. Famously, and obviously his, his wife had, had designed or commissioned this, the unfolded scroll with nothing written on it. People have taken it to be a kind of F you to the world or a Victorian symbol of mourning. Either way, it's, it's quite a, it's quite a, quite a, Quite a great for a lot of reasons. Sorry about my. Of course, this Herman Melville <laughs> on East 26th Street uh, doesn't exist today, the house he lived in, but he lived in there for the majority of the 30 years he lived in New York after the publication of Moby Dick. Um, uh, he would be shocked by this. That a street. He was thing. born down on Pearl Street or, or State Street. Like, uh, there's a glass office tower on his birthplace, isn't there? Yeah, it was close to it, too. And of course, it, it should be known, it should be remembered, too, that Gansevoort Street was named for his family, right? Uh, Herman Melville had quite a pedigree. Uh, both his grandfathers were, were um, Revolutionary War heroes. Tom Melville was the hero and the defender of Fort, St of Fort Stanwix. Uh, Tom Melville was a participant in the Boston Tea Party. And for years afterwards, the Melville children regale each other about finding tea leaves in Grandpa Melville's boots from the Tea Party. Yeah, and it was quite a, quite, quite a legacy that the Melville family uh, went through. Uh, here's a really kind of, this is one of my favorite parts of Melville's neglect. This one sentence is from this book. It uh, comes out in 1899, it's from Scribner's. It's a history of the United States of America it's 700 pages long. Herman Melville gets one line in it, and I'll read it. It begins here. Herman Melville, they spell his first name wrong. That often happened. They would spell his name wrong or whatever. Herman Melville, with his books about the South Seas, which Robert Louis Stevenson is said to have been the best ever written, and that is true. I'll talk about Stevenson in a second. And with his novels of maritime adventure, began a career of literary promise which never came to fruition. And end story, move, and you move on. Yeah, it's, it's, this is typical of, of Melville's um, uh, reputation at the turn of the century. Uh, when, when, when someone asked Edith Wharton about Herman Melville and her library, she had a great library, she said, oh yeah, friend of Hawthorne's. I read Taipei, we all read Taipei back in the day. That was the kind of reputation he had. The, well, he spent time up in the Berkshires with her, didn't he? Yeah, of course. Uh, no, 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 he, no. He, he, Edith Wharton actually called him, at one point, Bohemian. And, and for Edith Wharton, that was a great insult. That was, that was an insult, insult of insults. Um, no, Melville did, no, did not associate with the great dad of letters. Um, but back to that quote, though, it's an important bit about Robert Louis Stevenson. Oh, yeah. It, it, it was the British who were the first real 
readers of Melville before what we call um, the, the full Melville revival takes place. And there were two major British writers, uh, fiction writers, who were major Melville fans. There was Robert Louis Stevenson, who actually went to the South Seas to learn Polynesian because of Taipei and discovered that Melville's grip, uh, grip on language wasn't that great, um, but who wrote South Sea Tales because of Melville. And of course, his epic uh, book, uh, I, I say epic because of its impact, Treasure Island, is in many respects shot through with Melville um, things. Uh, my colleague, who's uh, an expert in piracy, says that that book has done more harm for pirate history than any other book ever, the X Mark the Spot stuff. Anyway, it was Robert Louis Stevenson and contemporary <coughs> D.H. Lawrence, who were the great um, British champions of Melville. Uh, D.H. Lawrence writes a very slim book called um, classic works of American literature <clears throat> that is, is short, but incredibly accurate. And he has the temerity in his, in his chapter on Melville to say, for me, the greatest poet of the sea is Herman Melville. That would be like saying something outrageous at the time, although it's very much accepted today. That's typical. Uh, here are the books, right? Um, Type P is 46, the same year as Tom Melville goes to sea at 16. And if you take out the books, right, Ty P through Moby Dick, it's one, two, three, four, five, six novels, right, six novels. Melville writes in how many years? Six years? He writes six novels in six years. One of them is Moby Dick. The output is, is, is Titanic. Uh, White Jacket itself is quite long, just in terms of word count. These are incredibly long works. Um, and then there's the book, Pierre, which he publishes after Moby Dick that no one knows about because probably no one should know about it. Uh, it's fascinating and wonderful. It's also kind of, uh, sorry about my firehouse going off. It's also kind of end of his writing career for many reasons. And then you've got, uh, uh, we've got Bartleby the Scrivener shows up uh, Later, and uh, which I think if people know Melville, they know uh, Moby Dick, obviously, and a lot of people know Bartleby. Yes. Now these were the stories of the, night, of the, of the mid 1850s when Melville was writing for magazines for money, and of course Bartleby. If you know, if Bartleby is just typical of Melville's writing, right? It's it's about 19th century America and American life, but it foreshadows modernism and existentialism and movements that wouldn't appear in philosophy and art for, for a century. Uh, many ways we call Melville our first modernist poet, and we can talk about that too, but those are the famous stories. The Confidence Man in 1857. This is the only thing I'll say about current politics, but before Philip Roth died, he said, the Confidence Man, that's exactly what's happening to American politics. Wow. And no. And then really, 1860 on, um, Melville turns to poetry. As my friend John Bryant once said, um, he fails at prose to make money, so then he jumps to something, a profession that obviously will make less money, poetry. And it, it worked, it worked. Uh, his, his collection of, uh, his body of poetry is astounding and a great undiscovered part of his work. In many respects, Melville is still a mystery. Because so, uh, given that it's a mystery, how, uh, Ronan wants to know how you would characterize him. Was Melville more of a writer, more of a sailor, or more of a shipbuilder? Uh, uh, as Everett Dykink, an early uh, critic, friend of, of Melville's once said, after a conversation with Melville, has a sailor ever thought like this? Because Melville was a sailor, right? He um, goes to sea as many young people did in the early 19th century to make money, right? And particularly uh, from a New England background. At the same time, um, he spends four, good four years, right, on whalers. He spends a good time, famously, as a common seaman aboard one of the original American frigates, the USS United States, a very famous ship, right? 
Um, and he gets home, and, and John Bryant is the person that we talk about this, but he gets home and something really, really spectacularly fascinating happens to Herman Melville, right? He didn't go to college, as we hear from Moby Dick. A whaler was Ishmael's Harvard and his Yale. What uh, Melville does when he gets home from sailing is to begin to write his sea stories, but then he begins to read, and he reads voraciously. Um, he tears through popular fiction, high, high philosophy, etc. And as, as John Bryant also points this out, uh, Melville says that he's unfolding himself at this point. And it's a mystery of artistry and genius how this sailor comes home and writes basically these outrageously entertaining books, but then turns with the book Marty and then of course Moby Dick philosophical, experimental. We have to remember that Moby Dick is a very experimental book for a lot of reasons, right? Um, we know it's common and famous plot just from popular fiction today, popular adaptations today, but the book breaks into play, Elizabethan play form, it explodes into philosophical uh, meditations upon everything. It's also, uh, there's a great book recently about this, it's also kind of history, natural history of the sea and man's relationship to that on a very one-on-one -on -one basis. It's an autopsy of American capitalism as it's being created. It's, in many respects, uh, a, book, uh, a, a book of mystery, a, a book that, um, that is not popular in 51, but is everywhere in our culture today, one, one uh, form or another and maybe also the great litmus test or, or, or uh, mask, to, to use a Melville term, of American culture and politics. I, I personally totally agree with you. I, I know we'll explore that more in the coming slides. Are there other titles we need to explore before we move on here? Uh, as my friend John Bryant has pointed out, Herman Melville was not a one book writer. Was not, right? I would point to the poetry. The poetry is incredibly rich and interesting. He has finally been appraised as he should be, right? As one of the most important poets of the 19th century, ranked with Americans like Whitman and Dickinson. But the poetry itself is not really well known. His epic poem, Clarelle of 1876, is longer than Paradise Lost. And it hasn't really been mined uh, critically, even by Melville people yet, I think, for what it is. It's kind of a cross-section between Dante's Inferno and the Victorian long poem. I would, so, something like the Robert Browning ring in the book. It's, it's classic late Melville. And again, the book I'm gonna talk about is John Moore and other sailors, his return to the sea in poetry which in many ways for me is tied directly to Tom Melville and the sailors he, he encountered at Snug Harbor. And of course, Billy Moore, which we'll, we'll, we'll end with. We'll keep Billy to the end. Of course, um, Melville's connection to American popular culture has to be connected in one way or not to the um, movies. And of course, the first version of Moby Dick to hit the screens with what Warner Brothers starred the profile from the silent period, John Barrymore, right? Legendary romantic figure. Uh, the book, Moby Dick, just no one knew the title in 26. So they called it The Sea Beast. And if you watch the movie, and of course, Barrymore is in the sound film, which comes out 35, the first, and it's called Moby Dick. But the, the plots are both the same. There's no Ishmael. Ahab is the main character, and he begins as a harpooner in both the silent version and the sound version. Uh, he begins as a harpoon, he's not the captain. He falls in love with uh, Father Maple's daughter, not in the novel, goes to sea, loses his leg to the whale, comes back, many different romantic problems occur. Of course, this is a silent film, so it's always really melodramatic. But the movie ends with him going back to sea, killing the whale, and the whale's not white, by the way, kills the whale at the end of the movie, comes home, and marries his love, the end. Uh, the sound version, which is, is it, you gotta see it to believe it, it's just an incredibly entertaining movie. Noble Johnson plays, quick, quick, Noble Johnson, the great African-American actor who played the chieftain in the original King Kong, plays Queequeg. Same storyline though, right? 
Ahab is the main character. He's a romantic lead. He ends up killing the whale at the end and achieving his love object. Classic Hollywood. And of course, um, uh, we're, we're... and of course, the, the movie right. that more high school students have used to write about Moby Dick is the '56 version from John Huston, which has a fascinating um, production history. Of course, Orson Welles is in the movie. Uh, John Huston directs. Ray Bradbury writes the screenplay. Uh, they almost all went crazy filming the thing in Ireland. It, it's a legendary story for a lot of reasons, but the the storyline, uh, the main storyline, right, of Ahab and his, and his doomed quest is, is in this movie, and it is just filtered throughout our culture in almost every conceivable way. Hold on. With coffee. And the coffee, of course. And this is a story I love to tell. Charles Schultz, the original CEO of Starbucks, when he started this small company, um, was going to call it Pequod Coffee after the great ship, after the Pequod. But someone pointed out to everybody that Pequod is too close to P. And who wants to drink pea coffee? Uh, obviously, this is named for Starbucks, name for the first mate uh, on the Pequod, which is incredibly ironic if you think about it, right? Herman Melville couldn't make a dollar off of Moby Dick. And Starbucks is a multinational corporation. I've heard of them, yeah. Yeah, I've heard of them. Starbucks made um, the abstract expressionists, particularly people like Jackson Pollock, were obsessed with um, Moby Dick, as were the Beats in general, Kerouac, Ginsburg, Burroughs, all major, because they all went to Columbia, where American literature was sort of invented academically. Uh, they're all major fans of Moby Dick. Uh, supposedly Jackson Pollock had a dog named Ahab, too. Well, uh, a, a major, an important figure for the expressionists. Frank Stella went a little overboard. He created a painting or a sculpture for every chapter of Moby Dick. And if you ever see it, it completely displayed, it's wonderful to see. Uh, more pop culture references. Led Zeppelin has a very famous instrumental piece called Moby Dick. Of course, there's the great uh, Bonzo, John Bonham, the hardest hitting drummer in rock and roll history, who was the centerpiece of Moby Dick, of that, of that piece. And when, when asked why they called it that, Bonham said, because once he said, it's big, that's all. But sometimes that drum solo would run for 18 minutes. Uh, the great uh, heavy metal band uh, Mastodon, who's critically acclaimed, has a novel called Leviathan, completely based on the story of the white whale. And of course, the strangest of all Stefan stories is the great German band Ahab. Um, their technical name for their metal is Funeral, gloom, doom, heavy metal, and the music fits that perfectly. They're German, and when asked why they call themselves Ahab, the lead singer says, it's because we wanted to channel old thunder in our music. Uh, it, it was it's quite a connection. Of course, uh, and the, the Moby Dick uh, novel has been made into films and into a famous opera which staging alone is fantastic. Although the most famous opera made from a Herman Melville work by far is the Benjamin Britten opera, um, Billy Budd, libretto by E.M. Forster. I mean, you can't get a better writing team. Right. Uh, Seth and I were talking about this too. When paleontologists discovered enormous uh, remnants of what we believe was an early giant sperm whale. They immediately called it after Melville, Livetian Melvilli. That's its scientific name. This uh, whale was so big, we believe it ate other whales. It was a monster. Was growing like I, yeah. I look, first looked at this and I thought they got something wrong because you know uh, Moby Dick talks about the, the teeth are only in the jaw and. This is a whole other animal, just really This is a whole other beast, that's for sure. Uh, here's a, a famous map of Melville's voyages, of both his voyages and of the, of the Pequod. They often intersect. Of course, the Pequod doesn't have a return voyage. You should know that, know that too. But these are the famous years of Melville's sailing, right? He leaves, um, he leaves Massachusetts in 41 aboard a whaler. 
comes back to the United States aboard one of the original six frigates, the USS United States as a common seaman. Uh, of course, the USS Constitution still exists. The USS United States was scuttled during the Civil War, but Melville had um, obviously fascinating sea time in these years that were really fodder for his first novels and obviously leaked from Moby Dick. He was all over the place. Of course, his first book was a great success, 46 Taipei. The word Taipei in the period really uh, was synonymous for sailors with one major thing, cannibalism, because the Taipei were legendary, legendary tribe in the French Marquesas, rumored to be vicious cannibals, aggressive cannibals. Um, on Melville's first whaling voyage, which was very unpleasant, I mean, you read about Melville's voyages, the captains are always either drunk or abusive or both. Uh, he jumped ship uh, in the Marquises with a friend of his, Toby Green. They spent about three weeks uh, in inland where they meet the Taipees. And of course their first uh, and major problem is not to meet the Taipees, but they run right into them. They expect of course the worst to happen, but they meet Melville and his friend meet the most wonderful people they've ever met kind, generous. Uh, of course, these are stories we hear about native peoples throughout our initial encounters, right? I mean, you hear about uh, Columbus uh, landing in the Americas, the Arawak Indians came to them bearing gifts, right? Anyway, uh, when um, Melville meets the Taipees, initially, as all sailors do, the fear of their reputation is there, but then he realizes that they are warm, kind people. Aggression doesn't seem to be a part of their culture. The big thing is absent, money. Money's absent in our culture. And of course, the, the, the Taipei, as many of the, the Polynesian natives practice, practice a form of um, human relationships that we would call free love or today, I guess, right? For a 19th century Victorian, uh, like Herman Melville, this was shocking. Uh, common marriage situations where a woman would have two husbands, etc. cetera. Um, more importantly, Melville came to believe that he was living with a, a, a perfect civilization. At the same time, when you read the text, there's always this tension of how he has to get back to the Western world he's come from, that he cannot be completely subsumed by this wonderful culture. The um, Taipei were heavily tattooed in ceremonial tattooing. And if, if you know the great Queequeg, of course, he's a great example, a royal example of that. Uh, the word tattoo, again, comes back to the West from Cook's initial journeys in the South Seas, right, tattoo. Uh, and, and it's fascinating because if you studied sailors' tattoos, before the interaction between Polynesian tattooing and Western tattoos, sailor tattoos were very functional, right? Sailors had their names on their bodies in case they were, their corpses were found, right? A famous one would be hold fast directions how to hold on to the rigging, etc. Polynesian tattoos were much more artistic and symbolic. They were much more, um, much more about the person that was getting the tattoo and not a label. And that really in impacted uh, what sailors thought about tattooing and how they embraced it. Uh, a famous scene from early etching of the novel when uh, Tomo, the, the Melville character, and his buddy come upon lovers in the grass, young people in the grass. This etching drove people wild in the uh, mid-1900s. <laughs> no As doubt. an example of, of, of primitive sexuality. Run, run wild! He's into all that fascination of that period, you know, with the... Uh... Uh, with artists going to the South Seas and so forth. Yes, yeah. yeah, from Gauguin on, right? And we have to remember this too, too, Stefan, right? Melville's original books, Taipei and Omu, were incredibly popular. For, for a lot of this risque description, people prefer them like Fei Wei, we'll talk about it in a second. But from the moment Taipei becomes popular to the moment Melville recedes from public um, attention, he is attacked consistently by the religious press, consistently for his critiques of the missionary mission in the South Seas, which he saw as tantamount to slavery, to genocide, to the end of these cultures. And he was writing about this in 1846, 1847, and for the rest of his career, hounded by the religious press for, for what they believed was, uh, was, uh, was a crossing of, 
of ideologies and of worldviews. And you, you can see that particularly in the incredible character of Queequeg. Queequeg That's is just that, right? George Washington cannibalistically developed a hero. Anyway, Fayoua was probably uh, Melville's first real uh, famous character, right? She was the image of beauty and um, the ideal of sexuality of of the of the inter in encounter with the Taipees, and she became connected to Melville over and over again. Um, uh, Sophia Hawthorne would often call Melville Fayaway. It was a really interesting romantic connection. And we have to remember too that early in his career, Mel um, Melville was a romantic figure, right? The sailor who lived with the cannibals. Right, right. Yeah. So here we of are. Of course, Queequeg's right. everywhere. Here's, here's a game. We cannibals must help these Christians is a line from Queequeg. Uh, Queequeg on Futurama, several episodes feature Moby Dick. And again, I, we can't go through this, but there's an enormous connection between science fiction, culture, and Moby Dick, beginning with Star Trek on. If you know the Wrath of Khan, Khan is very much. Uh, of course, uh, Deadpool finally kills the white whale in Deadpool Illustrated. If you know this comic, it's outrageous. Deadpool can't die and he wants to. So he decides to go back in literature and wipe out all the archetypes of literature. And, he and he, one of them is, is the white whale. Doesn't I work. I don't know anything about Deadpool, but you definitely made a good sell on me for it. Aha, back, back to reality. Now, of course, this is a very famous picture, right? This is the brothers, Herman and Thomas. As, as my friend John Bryan has often pointed out, uh, Herman Melville was lousy with brothers. He had three of them. The older one, Gansevoort, was often a substitute father for a lot of reasons, who dies in 46. His uh, brother closer to him was Alan Melville, a Tammany Hall lawyer who, who probably got uh, Tom Melville his job at Sailor Snug Harbor. And then Thomas, the youngest of them all, who 11 years, Herman Melville's uh, junior. Uh, when you hear about their family, their family's all living together. I don't know how Melville wrote anything, but. Melville at one point lived with Alan Melville, both of their families, their unmarried sisters, they had four of them at one point, their mother always living all together, and then there's always Tom Melville in the background, for the 14-year-old. Anyway, this is 1860. Let me go back to that picture one second. Yeah, yeah. We're within, within our last 10 minutes, incidentally. Yeah, yeah right. this is 1860, and this is a big year for the Melville brothers, right? Uh, I show this picture to a lot of people who are mariners, and they say, what, what kind of culture are they wearing? That was my one. These are shipwork coats. They're working on ships, right? And of course, uh, Melville, Herman's seated, Tom is standing. But this is 1860 when Melville takes a cruise with Tom aboard Tom's speed record uh, clipper, the Meteor. And their, their plan is to sail around the world. That's Melville's plan to get to China, maybe go to India. Clipper ships, of course, were literally racing at the end of the ages sail against what would destroy them, the steamship. They were literally racing against that, right? So in 1860, uh, Melville and uh, Tom board the Meteor. Tom is the master, and they sail to California. There is a change in um, cargo, so Melville doesn't continue on to the, to the east, but it's, it's not a good trip. Melville see, witnesses towards the end um, a deckhand, a, a, a sailor fall from the mast to his death. And it's a kind of just a bad scene for him. But more importantly, too, there's a great description of uh, a board ship in 1860 where the ship's carpenter carves out chess pieces for Tom and Herman to play chess with each other during their, their sailing. Um, Melville writes, keeps three journals throughout his life. He, he has a journal in the meteor, but it's short and, and not pleasant. Uh, he does write a letter to Tom about this famous trip. And it's one of his famous um, later letters where he talks about poetry and how he's gonna be writing poetry from now on. In 1860, he was supposed to publish a volume of poetry that didn't get accepted by publishers. And that famous letter I was talking about, he tells Tom how he took all those poems that weren't published and, and, and sold them to line the backs of trunks so people could line their trunks with his poems. Wow. That's what he thought of his work at that point. 
I, I know we're, we're probably not going to get to the whole Melville story today. We're within our last five minutes here. But uh, for those who want more detail, uh, Ronan would love to know, is there a good biography that you can recommend about Melville? There are many, right? Um, and there's the big one by Herschel Parker. It's two giant volumes. It's the place to go for facts. But we just mentioned John Bryant, who was actually publishing what's going to be, will be, the definitive biography, I think, of Herman Melville. And it's called Melville, A Half-Known Life. Its title is very important. It's going to be out in September. Um, uh, the thing about Melville, and I, and I know John could talk a lot more about this, is that we have a lot relatively a lot of information documentation about years between his birth and about 1860 it's those 30 years after which have plagued biographers because he didn't keep his letters he didn't he wasn't a public person anymore etc anyway this is tom in 1865 two years before he becomes governor and this is after his 20 years at sea again from a, a boy above a whaler and here's his last residence, the great governor's mansion at Sailor Sun Harbor, over 20 rooms, a staff of servants. We believe the Melville clan was here a lot. Uh, we know major events took place in the house around the Melville clan, particularly the death of their matriarch, Maria Melville, who dies in the house. Now, that, that's an important fact for anybody, right? But for the Melville clan, that is, uh, that's an epicenter of their family and their family tragedy too. Um, Tom Mevel himself will die in the house in 1884 of a heart attack at 54. Wow. At 54. Melville wow. will outlive all of his brothers. That's, that's a whole other burden to bear. Yes, <laughs> yes bad burden. Yeah, Melville had a lot of burdens to bear. Uh, 1867 was probably the worst year in Herman Melville's life. <clears throat> Uh, for two reasons. One, he had some marital problems at this time, too. He had been just started his job as a custom inspector. And of course, the, the pivotal event in 1867 is the suicide of his oldest son, Malcolm Melville, in his bedroom. Um, event that would obviously devastate anyone. Uh, if you read, oh, by the way, there's a great novel about all this by Frederick Bush, The Night Inspector which I highly recommend, uh, Frederick Bush's novel, which is about a Civil War veteran who had a horrible Civil War wound, who meets Herman Melville, and they have a, uh, a friendship. It's an interesting book, right? It, but, but it takes place in 1867. Again, the worst probably year in Melville's life. But 1867 was also the year that Tom Melville got the best job in New York City. Melville was working the dock six days a week, four hours a week. He once got a decrease in pay, right? Uh, Tom Melville was started out $2,000 a year as the governor. That was doubled within two years. All of his living expenses were paid for by the institution, etc. cetera. Uh, all the governors of uh, Selsun Harbor had their portraits painted. And, and Stefan and I were talking a little bit about the, about the incredible art collection, maritime art collection owned and bought and created by um, Snug Harbor. This portrait today, and this is my bad picture, but this portrait today um, hangs in the Noble Collection. I highly recommend um, people to check out um, the Noble Collection for how they preserve um, Snug Harbor artifacts, their art. Uh, the, the Noble Collection, Ciro, Megan Beck, Aaron Urban, of course, these people are really maritime heroes, local maritime heroes. Absolutely, and, and not well known as-, as yeah. Well, they should be. Should be. Should be, should be. And that's, that's Tom Melville's portrait as it hangs today. Uh, in 1870, I think it's 74, um, there was a big story about Sailor Snug Harbor and Harper's, Harper's Weekly. And here's the etching at the beginning of that article. The guy admitting people into Sailor Snug Harbor is Tom Melville. Right there. And again, I love, uh, Stephen and I were talking about this, but I love going to Staten Island and talking to local Staten Island people they have all this great weirdo underground gossip about everything. Uh, I got yeah. last time I was there, someone told me, oh yeah, they poisoned Tom Melville because they're always fighting about everything. Uh, late in his career, and this is 1888, uh, Melville, Melville really stops publishing for public consumption um, late in his career, right? 1888, he publishes John Marr and other sailors. He publishes in a private edition of 25 copies. 
And this is really is uh, Melville's last uh, maritime work. Everything in it, every poem in it, in one form or another, is about a maritime experience. It really, John Moore and the other, uh, the, the three sailors at, at the head of the, of, the, of the book are older sailors coming with the, to the grips of the end of their lives. John Moore, the title, um, title poem, is a sailor who spent many years at sea, lost his family, ends up in the Midwest, and the poem ends with him in a field, and then he turns, and then he just sees all the ghosts of all the sailors, all his shipmates, for years and years and years aboard ship. It's really kind of a wonderful thing, too. It reminds us that, of course, that um, Herman Melville spent a lot of time at Sail Snow Harbor, and, it, and there he spent a lot of time with his brother, but he also spent a lot of time with these sailors, working mariners from every ship you can imagine, uh, with every experience, experience you can imagine at sea. And, and the stories that they told, and he probably told them, just get tied up in these late works. Uh, of course, the great last work, Billy Budd, emerges from, from this, right? Billy Budd started as a poem. I, I just want to break in briefly. Uh, we're, we're going to keep going through your slides here, but I appreciate the indulgence of our audience to stay with this fascinating story as we go uh, past the half hour mark. Uh, and I, I also want to point out that you're mentioning uh, with the poems about the end of sailors' lives. That just highlights the importance of Snug Harbor. That you, know, you had this incredible place where these people were so well taken care of. And before that, the alternative was really dire for old sailors. Yes. It was poverty, it was death, death in the street. Yeah, and of course, that when we were talking about this too, right? The institution was incredibly well-funded and it still helps mariners to this day, right? At the same time, there was constant fighting all the time between the inmate residents and the administrators, constantly, constantly fighting. Uh, Stefan and I were talking about this, probably a couple of things that caused these conflicts were the fact that all these sailors from different ships and different ranks were all called captain, all called the same rank. And if you know oh, Mariners. I, I've been reading this book, uh, The Folksal and uh, the, uh, the Glory Hole, about yeah. the structure of ships and, and the, the care, the, the extent they went to to keep the, the officers separate from the sailors before the mass. <laughs> The Siemens Church Institute's uh, hotel at 25 South Street. The officers were kept separated. This is really important. And they yeah. just threw that out the window in yeah. retirement. Everyone equal on a ship? No way. No way, right? Uh, that, and of course, the big one was the prohibition against drinking. Now, you could leave. If you were in Manistel, you could leave and do whatever you want. You couldn't come back intoxicated, and you couldn't drink on the grounds. In the 1980s, there was a cultural anthropologist who did a big site inspection of Sailor Snug Harbor, right, as a, as a, just as a site. And they discovered mounds and mounds of hidden bottles all over the, all over the grass where the sailors <laughs> have been drinking and burying their bottles. Um, yeah. the, sa the same person, and, and, and the person, is, she's a cultural historian of, of city sites, also called uh, her, Tom Melville a paradox when she was going through the archives for a couple of things. One, he really modernized everything, the record keeping, how the inmates uh, worked on, um, on, the, on the land, etc. At the same time, his prohibitions against drinking and not going to church were really strict, were really strict. Right, you can worship any god you wanted to, but you had to do something on on the Sabbath. That was, that was, and of course, the big taboo at Sailor Sun Harbor that really, really bothered them was the was a taboo if you really got into trouble against tobacco. If you you were forbidden to have tobacco, you were screwed. And of course, Sailor Sun Harbor grew their own tobacco. Now, we've, we've returned to the word taboo, which is kind of where we began. We really need to wrap up in just a yeah. moment. And so what, uh, what, what are, do you have any final words on Tom Melville and Herman Melville? And well, I the apologize. More, the more I read about Tom, Mel Tom Melville, the more I'm fascinated by him, right? Here's a person who achieved the highest um, levels of, of mariner service as a professional mariner, right? To be a master of a clipper ship at the high end of the age of sail was something, was, was an expertise to have, right? 
He ends up selling the meteor in India at one point. It's really kind of fascinating. Um, at the same time, he becomes the head of the, the most famous um, retirement home for Mariner sailors ever, modernizes the place, et cetera. Um, and to sum it up, I would say this, that Herman Melville's last 30 years that we know nothing of could really be kind of summed up by, by, by if you go back to that last slide, oh, yeah, yeah. This poem, by, by the poem that, that, um, that the symbol just passed through, that Melville wrote a bunch of poems to his brother. Here's one of them that he did not publish, but a form of, a form of it is, is in uh, John Marr. But um, I think the important line is my gallant Tom and, and other letters too. Melville called his brother, my hero. Uh, in many respects, you know, Tom fulfilled every, uh, every aspiration America could have, uh, every kind of character that Melville could write about, his brother was. And then at the same time, when Melville visited his brother sailors on Harbor, uh, the inmates of the institution were, were sailors with incredible varying backgrounds that that he must have in one form or another interacted with, right? We have letters about him visiting Snow Harbor. There were daily ferries to it from the Battery. Um, if there is a lost time in Herman Melville's life as his last 30 years, a key to them is the 17 years that, um, that Tom Melville was, was the governor of Snow Harbor. And, and again, that the title of governor is, is, sounds like ridiculous for an institution like that, but it had that kind of weight. It had that kind of weight for the period. We should point out that the, the snugs, as we know them, were referred to in, as inmates, but it wasn't like they were prisoners. Despite oh, all. They, they call themselves prisoners. I think I told you this stuff until I found it something in the archives, right? In Tom Melville's hand, a list of conspirators. People trying to overthrow his authority. Uh, the governor after uh, Tom Melville, Trask, was actually shot by an inmate. I, His life was saved because he was carrying a bunch of books or something, and the, and got, the book got cut in the papers. Yeah, they were constantly fighting over everything. Um, more importantly, too, Billy Budd, the last work by Herman Melville, is a work that seems to be far removed from Melville's American maritime experience, right? It takes, takes place aboard a British warship during the Napoleonic Wars, right? But it's a story about discipline and the problems of leadership. Because as we know, Billy Budd is as guilty as hell and is as innocent as heaven at the same time. And Captain Beer has to adjudicate that problem, right? Um, and again, Billy Budd, that famous last short novel by Melville, comes from a poem. He was writing about a sailor, a sailor at the end of his life. And Billy Budd emerges from that. Well, that's uh, a, 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 an extraordinary introduction to a story that is clearly uh, far deeper than we could possibly uh, delve into in, in the time we have. Uh, so I, I will, we'll all keep our eyes peeled for John Bryant's book and look forward to uh, further stories emerging from your research. And I just can't thank you enough. I, my apologies to those whose questions we didn't get to, uh, but uh, we you know, sent, uh, stay in touch with us and we'll, we'll get you answers as we're able to. And uh, John Rocco, thank you again for joining no us. No problem. Go to Snug Harbor. It's the most, one of the most beautiful places of all, in all of New York City. Absolutely. Uh, an overlooked gem. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Take care. Be well. And we will see you soon. Have a great day.